Hey guys, I thought we would discuss that age old question of should you or are you ready to breed your snakes? And I can understand why everybody wants to. Uh, this is a snake that I produce and all the snakes that I have for this video are snakes that I produce. This is Callisto here. Um, she is a uh, Borneo short tail python. She's a side swipe. Uh, she's also genetic striped. Um, so when you're thinking about breeding, you need to have goals in mind. Um, and before you even get into that, you need to make sure that you're ready. Um, snake breeding is a lot of responsibility and uh, it's a lot more than just keeping snakes. Uh, it's not something I recommend you get into right away. I recommend keeping for a while first, uh, getting you know used to your snakes and their behavior and learning how to take care of them. Um, so the first thing you need to look at is do you have the means to be breeding snakes? Uh, it takes a lot of time, uh, especially once you have babies, there's a lot of work to be done. It's not, uh, you know, just fly by night and, and you're good. You've got a lot of things you have to do. So you need to make sure that you have the time to do it. Uh, you also need to make sure you have the money on tap. It does cost you money. Yes, eventually you can sell babies and you can make money off of those babies, uh, but there's no guarantee that they will sell. There's no guarantee how fast they're gonna sell. Uh, so you wanna be able to uh, take care of them without having to worry about that coming back to you. Uh, also, you need to have some knowledge. You shouldn't be jumping in right away. Babies can have complications, complications that you don't necessarily see in older animals. So you have to be ready. You have to know about things like hard belly and things like that. Um, we're not gonna get into those things in this video. This is gonna be pretty rudimentary, uh, but those are things that you need to know uh, and you need to be prepared for. Uh, a herp vet, in case something goes wrong, does the female get egg bound? Are there other issues? Um, you know, her life should be your priority. So if something like that happens, you need to be prepared to uh, take her in or to fix the problem and uh, give her the best chance of, of survival and, and good health. Uh, that's our priority. These are our, our babies. Um, they're not baby factories. So we need to make sure that we're doing things for their health. So you need to make sure you understand their reproductive health. You know, what's a healthy size? What's a healthy weight? Um, how often should she be having babies or, or laying clutches of eggs? Uh, what kind of feeding schedule should be on? These are all things that you're gonna to wanna to learn in advance of even thinking about pairing up snakes. Uh, genetic knowledge is important to have. Uh, depending on the species you're breeding and the genetics you're working with, there could be issues connected to it. So you need to be aware of those. Uh, ideally, you're not breeding stuff that gives you that uh, higher potential of those issues. Uh, we wanna, you know, we have lots of strong genetics to work with. There's not really a reason to work with ones that are weaker or have issues. Um, especially if it's something that is going to be produced over and over like that. Uh, space. Space is another factor. A, for the babies themselves, but if you get stuck on those babies for one year, two years, three years, their whole life, do you have the space to grow and to accommodate them with proper enclosures for their size? Um, you know, a snake like this as an adult is going to need at least a four by two cage. So if you have a whole clutch of 15 of these and you get stuck with them all, do you have space for 15 cages? So it's important to keep those things in mind. Uh, as far as the equipment you're going to need to have, obviously you're going to need to have an incubator. Uh, you can construct your own incubator. You can buy ones that are already made. There's a lot of options out there that are great options, uh, but you do need to be prepared uh, and have an incubator. Yes, maternal incubation can be done, but I don't think it's really smart to do as your first, first clutch, um, especially if, if you're lesser experienced with snakes because the, the Eggs are gonna require a lot more maintenance on your part and on mom's part uh, in that scenario. And mom's gonna require you to keep, a, keep an eye on her and make sure she's staying healthy through the process. Because just like breeding takes a lot out of their body, so does maternal incubation. Um, especially in some of the python species where they're constantly contracting muscles and doing things to try to raise the egg temperature and, and, and do all those things that, that she's gonna do as a good mom. Um, so you're gonna need some kind of substrate to incubate your eggs in. Uh, so you wanna keep that in mind. I use vermiculite, but there are several options. Uh, you're gonna need water dishes, you know, for each cage that you're gonna have those babies in. And a food source is one of the most important things people tend to forget about. Most babies are gonna start on live food and they're gonna need small food items. Um, depending on the species you breed, typically, you know, anything from mouse hoppers to rat pups or you know, even mice pinkies, like day old pinkies, if you're breeding something like corn snakes, for instance. So it's important to make sure that not only do you have steady access to that, um, but that it's gonna be cost effective for you and that it's coming from a good source. 
Uh, so you have to look into all that stuff. You also need to be prepared. Sometimes a baby comes out deformed to where it, it's not going to survive or you know you have to cull it. So you have to be ready to pivot those babies and know how to do that. Uh, so that's an important thing to be ready for. It's an unfortunate part of it, but you know we have to be ready for the good and the bad. Um, you're also gonna uh, have to be prepared, as I said, if you may have to sit on all the babies. Um, you know, you're gonna have to take time to find suitable homes for each one that you sell. You know, it's not just the first person to come with you with that $100, $200, $1,000, whatever it is. You wanna make sure you're putting that baby in a situation with a person where they're gonna thrive. Um, that's really important. Otherwise, why are we doing this? You know, it's all about the animals and getting them into good homes. So you wanna make sure that that's something that you, you put time aside for. Um, and there's a lot of cleaning involved with babies. Babies go to the bathroom a lot. Uh, especially with the short tails, you know, short tails are known for going long periods of time without defecating. That goes out the window with babies. Sometimes two, three times a week they go. Uh, oftentimes you'll clean their cage and within two hours they go again. So you've got to be prepared. You're going to be cleaning a lot. Uh, it's not something where you can just do it once a week and say, oh, they're good. You're going to be in there two to three times a week, expect for each baby. Um, Plus that gives you time hands-on really quick to inspect them and make sure that everything's going well, if they're healthy, um, you know, if they're feeding, if they're digesting their food properly. Uh, so this is all, all stuff that that affords you. So you really need to be on top of that. Um, it's important to have goals. So you don't just want, I have a female snake, I need a male for it. Um, and that's a mistake. There's a lot of people breeding snakes now, a lot more than ever. Uh, and the demand sometimes gets, gets below the supply. Um, and that's why with a lot of the more common species like ball pythons, for instance, there's so many going into rescue organizations that it's overwhelming them um, because there's so many being produced that just there's not the demand for and people lose interest. Uh, people are chasing new genes and they want to get rid of their older genes or their single gene animals are obsolete to them now. Uh, it shouldn't be that way. You should plan on keeping your breeders for life, ideally. Every once in a while, there's one that doesn't fit into a project anymore and you find a suitable home for it and that's wonderful. Um, but you really should plan on, they put in the work for you, you put in the work for them. So they, they gave you those clutches, they gave you those babies, they gave you those wonderful holdbacks. They deserve a nice retirement with you too. Uh, people need to stop treating these animals like they're collector cards or coins or stamps. They're living creatures and they get used to a life with us, um, not necessarily on a social level, but they get used to how we handle. My dog is an idiot. Sorry. Uh, she just hates all human and animal life. So anytime anybody walks by, she loses her mind. Um, so you, uh, I lost my train of thought totally. We were talking about babies. Oh, and, and so when you keep, you want to keep your breeders because, you know, they're used to 10 years with you or eight years with you of how you handle them, the conditions in your home. All of a sudden, later in life, switching them up like that can really uh, send them for, for quite a loop. I mean, just imagine you're happy in your life and all of a sudden one day you're, you're homeless, you're sent somewhere else, you lose everything that you know. So it, it can make it very difficult. So it's really decent of you to, you know, have these animals for life and, and plan on that. Uh, so as I said, you want to you wanna have a plan. So what are you adding to the species or to the hobby in general with your breeding projects? Are you adding color? Are you adding, you know, different morph combinations that don't exist? Are you perfecting something to a better level than it's been done? Um, you know, I see a lot of people and it drives me crazy breeding, you know, something that's not desirable just to get breeding experience. It takes the same amount of work, especially when you're talking about morphs, to breed a, a six or seven gene animal or a high quality animal that it does to breed something that's less desirable. So if you truly are invested in this, invest and, and produce something that's, that's gonna have a better shot at a decent life. Unfortunately, you know, a $5 animal should get the same treatment as a $5,000 animal, but it just doesn't work that way by and large. People put a value on something based on how much they pay for it, um, which is an unfortunate thing, but it is, it is the reality of, of this 90% of the time. So you want to be putting animals out there that are gonna be desirable that there's going to be suitable homes for and that people are going to value and take care of. So keep that in mind with your projects. Um, you know, and that's one of those things. You should breed what you like, but you also need to make sure that there's some kind of demand or market for it, especially if you don't intend to sit on everything. If you intend to keep everything that you breed, breed whatever you like. 
um, you know, by all means, and you should breed whatever you like anyhow, but you really, really should be looking to make examples of these animals that are, that are gonna be in demand. And there's nothing wrong with wild types and line breeding. I do that with my bloods, uh, my Sumatran short tails. Uh, those are some of the most sought after animals that I produce are stuff that aren't morphs, that are just quality line bred normals, if you will, or wild types, which I prefer. Uh, normals kind of a funny term with snakes since no two are usually really alike. Uh, there is no normal, but wild type is something where they're not expressing any, any gene that, that we know and quantify. It's just something that's been line bred. I don't know where Kalisto's going. Um, so some of the other animals that I have, just to show you, you know, what I breed for. With bloods, I like color, but I do like morphs as well. So this is a T-positive batik. I'm gonna put him down so I can get her. Everybody, there you go. So he is you know, expressing a morph, but there's also line breeding going on in here and, and polygenic stuff where, you know, you're trying to work on, on higher color and it doesn't really show in this video, unfortunately, um, but he is super red for a, for a T-positive batik um, and he's gonna be a really great addition here. He should probably be ready next year or the year after. Bloods tend to mature a little bit slower than uh, say your ball pythons. So it's, it's not uncommon for a, a blood or short tail male to not be ready to breed until he's three or four years old. The joy of working live with animals. Um, so another thing we were talking about with the uh, line breeding, I mentioned the Sumatran short tails. You guys saw my video with Voodoo Queen. This is actually her sister, just uh, a couple years younger. So same parents, same pairing, um, but she's younger. So she still hasn't quite developed as dark. This snake will probably finish darker than Voodoo Queen. She's darker than she was at her age. Uh, so we'll see what happens. But that's a project that I enjoy with these is trying to make the darkest ones I can. Now my goal with those is that I want to eventually eliminate the brown from them all together uh, from a much earlier age. So my goal is to get them hatching out with almost no brown. So the animals that I'm holding back sometimes might not be necessarily the darkest looking out of the clutch, but they're the ones that have the most black and I do like the white contrast as well. So I'm selectively picking animals that are gonna get me closer and closer to that goal, to my ultimate end game, to where I can, you know, all but wipe that out. You'll never really get rid of something like that completely. There'll be babies that pop up with it from time to time, but I do wanna reduce it. And then I do have different types of uh, side swipe. And we'll see if this girl lets me pick her up. She looks a little annoyed. Uh, this is another side swipe. She's also a direct sibling to this girl. Uh, but also from a different clutch in a different year. Kalisto's on the move today. Uh, so this is, this is the same genetic um, combination and the same animal, basically, but different because Borneos are so, are so polygenic, you get different expressions of the same gene quite often. Um, so I have another snake that's actually her sister that's more similar to this one named Astra, for those of you that have followed me on other platforms. Uh, and I'm hoping that this girl is gonna turn out a lot like Astra. So with my Borneo projects, I, I have a lot of Borneo projects going on, which is one of the things when you get into a species like these, be prepared to have a lot of them because there's so many cool examples that it's hard to just focus on one thing. Um, so I have a lot of different projects. I work with Blue Ghost, I work with Ocelot. I do a couple of different genetic stripe lines, the side swipe, I have super stripe. Uh, I have ultra stuff, I have white ghost. Um, so there's a lot of stuff going on and I like to keep a lot of the stuff separate and then occasionally I'll mix some of it in for certain projects. And as you can hear, uh, these guys are pretty vocal. Uh, that can be pretty common with them. Doesn't necessarily mean anything, sometimes it can, but her body language is still very good. Her tongue flicks are still very good. Um, she's just a busy bodied snake as you've seen throughout this video. So I'm gonna cut this short because I tend to run a little bit long. Uh, but basically, just make sure that you're invested in what you're doing uh, and that you're prepared for it. Breeding isn't something that should be entered with reckless abandon. It's not something that you really should be learning completely on the fly. I do recommend finding a mentor if you can. Um, that's something that's really going to help you out. And sometimes you will outgrow those mentors eventually, which really should be your goal. You know, you should want to learn more and more and you should want to advance. Um, but definitely having that in your corner from the get-go really helps. 
for those initial questions, the things that you're not necessarily going to be able to just Google and figure out, uh, those, the things you're going to need help interpreting data on, uh, and if an issue arrives that you didn't expect, uh, you didn't come across researching, you have that person to fall back on to see what you should be doing. All right, uh, as always, I love to hear what you think. Hopefully you guys watched the whole video, um, saw some cool snakes, saw some of the things that I like to work on. Uh, at some point I'll do some like genetic crash course type stuff and focusing on an individual project on a video and highlighting it, uh, just to give you some variety. Uh, and I just saw King Diamond this weekend, amazing. I uh, got to meet him the whole band, great experience. So I, I recommend that if you get a chance to do that, great people. Thank you.